Good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon, Caroline. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon. That was Kirsten. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mackenzie. I think that was, or oh no, that was Mackenzie joining. Okay, sorry. Good afternoon. Okay, hold on. Yes, good afternoon. Caroline Kirsten, good afternoon, Caitlin. Kevin, good afternoon, Amanda. I'm confused. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon, iPhone, which I think is Sam. No, I can't remember who iPhone is. Maybe you'll tell me. I think it's Samuel, maybe. Good afternoon, Amy. Good afternoon, Irene. Good afternoon, Emily. Good afternoon, Erica. Good afternoon, Dave. Good afternoon, Adon. Good afternoon, Lizzie. Good afternoon, Evan. Good afternoon, Sumaya. Good afternoon, Yuben. Oh, ignore my email, Yuben. Right, I get it. My confusion. I don't know if you've already responded. I get it. Right, you're here, Yuben. Yes, I get it. My bad. Anyway, but and there goes my board. But yes, good to see everybody, but good to see you, Yuben. I I apologize for my mistake in an email that I just sent this morning. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Mackenzie. Good afternoon, Rashman. And good afternoon, Rashman. And good afternoon, Al. Yes. And good afternoon, Estrella. Good afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Yes. My bad. Okay. Good. Okay. Good talk, you bet. Okay. Um, and I remember now. I really do. I remember. It's been momentary. It's been stressful. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Who did I miss? I think I said Mackenzie. Oh, oh, an iPhone is you. Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you, direct chat person. Got it. Got it. I like hard. I mean, you know, the only thing spazzier than me is me when I'm spazzy, if that makes sense. Uh, and hello, Kevin. Yes. Sorry. I mean, hello, everybody. Yes. Hello, direct chat. Okay, I just better get this rolling. Um, good afternoon, Jose. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Who am I forgetting? Okay. I think I've got everybody. Okay. The board. I finally have realized part of what goes on with the board, but that doesn't matter. All right. We're going to get this board back going. Again. I want to say, well, I actually, hold on. All right. We're here. We're going to do some material today. Quick announcements and material. Uh, I was, but even for me, I'm going to warn you right now. I mean, I'm a spazzy guy in general and don't think I don't know it. I'm sure I don't know the extent of it, but I, I don't know. But even by my standards, even for me this morning, I was class was particularly spazzy. So bear with me. I mean, I shocked myself. I mean, so bear with me for a moment. Apparently, I'm. I don't know what. Um, hold on. So just. I do intend to teach physics today. I don't know, just as like a rare, um, unusual, novel approach. And the physics teaching will commence momentarily. I want to see. Okay. 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 And normally, as you know, and the reason I'm, oh, let me switch in the chat. Normally, oh, no, I don't believe we do. Okay, hold on, logistic. Wow, I, no, there's a question in the direct chat that's certainly an important question, and there's only one question in the direct chat. Uh, so if you have asked a question, then it is yours that I see. Um, 
Okay, give me a second. Five. So there's 20 people in the room right now. No, there's 25 people. There's 24 people in the room right now. Okay. Okay, let me work backwards for a second. First of all, there's a question in the direct chat. I want to make sure. I believe I know the answer, but I want to make sure I'm not crazy about this. My understanding is we do not, that we go on break Tuesday night. My understanding is that we do not have John Jay scheduled this Wednesday and therefore that we don't have class this Wednesday. Am I, did I just make that up? Is that, can I please get in the chat confirmation that's, or? That's true. No, you're right. It starts on the 5th, which is this Wednesday. So we're off starting Wednesday. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for using your voice, by the way. That's terrific. Okay, and, and thank you. And you should submit for points for that. Okay, nice to hear you. Um, okay. Okay, so partly just to address, because someone was asking in the chat. So yes, we do not have class this Wednesday. Okay, thank you. And I thought that, just to make sure. So we don't have class this Wednesday, but not because I'm canceling it, but because we don't. So I hope that answers you in the direct. But are we going to meet the following? week on Monday and Wednesday. Wait, uh, now I'm confused. Wait a second. I thought the break goes, wait a minute. Next Monday, we don't have school, do we? We have school next Monday? No, it goes April 5th to April 13th. So we're not coming back, at least for lecture, until like the 17th. Right. Okay. Which is a long time for Right. Okay. No, thank you all. Oh, and thank you in particular, Alex. I appreciate, I mean, that you're speaking so clear. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I thought. So, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. I see what's happening in the direct chat. Okay. Okay. No, this is important to clarify and often I'm confused. So yeah, for people in the direct chat or anybody who's asking right now, yeah, we don't have class for a while after this, which is, wow. I mean, yeah, that's a lot, I, but right. So we don't have class this coming Wednesday and we don't have class the next Monday and we don't have class the next Wednesday. That's true. I mean, so thank you. Um, so then we come back and meet as a lecture. Yes, okay, two weeks on the 17th. And I'm glad you're clarifying for me too, okay. And maybe the couple of people in the direct chat, well, no, it looks like, so the people that were asking in the direct chat seem like they're telling me in the direct chat that they get it now. So good. I'm glad we've cleared that air. Good. Um, so when this class is over, you'll have a very good break, we hope. Uh, uh, I, I, I will say that, okay, so, so, and then, and then, you know, then it's a very fast ramp till the end of the semester, which is funny, a very fast ramp. Um, so, so, so let me back up to what I was going to say before then it's all kind of related. Um, first of all, there's 24 of you in the room right now. So let me start by saying thank you and congratulations. Like seriously, there's 24 in, of you in the room right now. And uh, okay, wait, all right. So we might as well, uh, okay. We might as well figure this out right now. I mean, so someone, so Alex is asking in the group chat, When's our last lecture day? I would have said, I mean, I will triple check right now. I think it's like May, I would have guessed something like May 7th or whatever that last one is, but I will check right now. Hold on. I mean, it's very, I mean, it's shockingly soon given all this information we just said. Hang on, I do have this one second. May, oh, okay. I'm looking. I am seeing that things are having the chat. I'm just confirming now while you do this in the chat, just because we might as well have this straight. And it's true. We don't have that. What is What I definitely have known is we don't have that many more classes left. I mean, that 
And that's sort of why I'm glad you all got your final exam out of the way before the break. And that's what we're going to talk about then. Say, okay, so the last day of classes. Yeah, the last day of classes is Tuesday. This so it looks like Katya. Yes, yes. So what you guys are saying in the chat, I'm confirming right now. And in fact, I will put that in my thing right now. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. What? What Amanda and Katya and Caroline are saying in the chat is correct. And thank you, all three of you, all of you, um, that May 15th, and I'm going to make sure, I mean, I'm sure I have this in my calendar, but I, May 15th is the last lecture. And as far as lab, Well, I forget you. This section, you guys normally, you have lab. Can you remind me? I forget your labs are on Fridays normally. Is your yeah Fridays with with Melendez correct? Like you're with Melendez on Friday. Okay, yeah, okay. So yeah, uh, then therefore that means your last lab would be Friday, um, the uh, May. Uh, May 12th, Friday, May. I think it's May 5th. Yeah, wait, you're right. Wait, that's so weird. Because mm -hmm. the 12th is given as a reading day for yeah. everybody, so there's no classes. Yeah, I think you're right. And sorry, and I was just looking at who, yeah, yeah okay, I'm going to back up and confirm that. Yeah, that's very strange, but you're right. But who, but just because I was looking at the calendar, not at the Zoom, just was that Caroline just, or who was just saying? Yeah, that? it was me. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh my God. I am glad we're having this discussion now. That's bizarre. Um, Why they stick that in like that, but okay. So, so yes, though, I agree and I confirm. I would try to put this in the Google Classroom, but, and if you have friends in the other section, you maybe you want to tell them too, but yes, that's, well, I mean, their lab is on a different day. So that's kind of funny, but um, Caroline is right that the last lab would be May 5th. I will also, I was about to say that generally our last lab is, is meant usually as a review for the final, like you, but I can't, so usually you try to deal with the practice exam during the last lab and go over I know I can't promise that if it's going to be as early as May 5th. I don't, I, I, I will talk with Melendez about this and everything. I can't hundred percent promise that the, I can tell you. I mean, I'll have to get back to you on this. I mean, I, I, I will get back to you on what you, I don't want to make any promises about what you're going to do that day, but I do agree with Caroline and I do promise. Yeah. That's your last lab is the fifth. I mean, that is true. And your last, yeah, no, thank you guys. I mean, and yes, thank you guys. And this is important. And I want to just um, give me a second. I'm going to put this in my calendar. So I don't mess it. I mean, I think it's there, but I didn't realize that about the lab, but that's true. Um, Okay. Okay. So hopefully that answers that. Now that, 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 um, we won't see each other for a long time after today. Um, you know, of course I would hope to have your exams back for you when I next see you. And now that I know it's that long from now, I mean, I certainly hope so. It turns out all the classes turned in exams right now, which was not my intention or not originally the plan. So it's a little overwhelming, but um, I would certainly hope and try my best. Have it before then, I can also tell you right now, I mean, this is what we did last semester, I believe. Um, at least I, I, we're clearly doing less material after the midterm than we did before your final exam. Yes, it would be hard to take your final exam if you hadn't been paying attention and following this physics of the... 
the bulk of the semester, but then the final exam will technically explicitly only cover material that we did post midterm, just if anybody's wondering, and it'll be the same fashion, the same style as this exam. Um, so, it, so in other words, it'll be less material, your final exam, uh, for whatever it's worth. Um, and I'm going to get into that. And, and for the rest of time now, what we're, what we're trying to move for the most of the rest of time from when you get back, from when you get back after break, we're mostly about fields, currents, and radiation at that point, i.e. electricity and magnetism, mostly electricity. Um, just as an overall sum, I want to remind you again that all of this buildup and all of the hard math and all the oscillation stuff was all a big buildup, was all setting the ingredients in the context of particles moving from one point in space to another. Everything we were doing technically, all that oscillation stuff was technically still the mathematics of a very particular type of particle motion from point A to point B. And in our case, from point A to point B and back again to point A, cyclical motion. But the whole idea of all of that is that we were finally, we were trying to get enough math and enough understanding to be able to see that if we put together a whole bunch of particles moving in a very, very particular way, moving in a big space pattern of time patterns, then we would create a motion or we could imagine how nature could create a motion that is not particle motion. What we created in our minds and in the lab with all of that math and all of that oscillation of oscillations stuff, what we created was an understanding of our first type of non-particle motion, our first type of propagation, and that is wave propagation. Today's class, we're going to do one almost final bit on one final subtopic about wave motion, but just to make everything clear or sort of give you the big picture, the rest of the semester is on electrical currents and electrical fields, and then to a certain extent, electromagnetic radiation. If that, and, and, and some of you, I get the different classes confused. You may have already started that in lab. I can't remember, maybe you'll tell me in a second. And it may have, it may have seemed like a big jump out of nowhere. Like we've been doing all of this oscillation stuff. And then finally all this wave stuff. And then suddenly we're, we're gonna be talking about, or you already in lab talking about like electrical currents and electricity. And for those of you that that, that seemed like out of nowhere, two points. One, that's the rest of the semester is on the electricity stuff. But two, what I want you to see, the connection, I mean, it seems, it feels out of nowhere. It certainly felt out of nowhere to me as a student when that happened to me in certain classes. But the connection, the point, is that from here on in, anything that we talk about in this class, from here on in, anything we talk about is motion of some kind from here to there that is not of material particles. Whether it's a wave pulse, or an electrical current, or an electrical field, or a magnetic field, or an electromagnetic radiation. What we're talking about for the rest of this course is information moving from here to there, disturbances of some kind, energy flow of some kind. We're talking about motion that is not of material or massive or, or countable particles anymore. And if, if I can leave you with like one big theme or one big sort of helpful suggestion for the rest of your science classes and the rest of your science careers, in sci particularly for example, PCHEM that many of you will take next semester, in science, we're all, sometimes we're studying the motion of actual material objects from here to there, even though they might be really, really small, like electrons, we're sometimes studying the motion of 
really small or really big material objects from here to there. But sometimes in science, we're studying the flow of information from here to there. And to me, it turns out it was very helpful. And it, it can be really confusing if you think we're talking about one, but we're actually talking about the other. And once people get really entrenched in talking about one or the other, they get so entrenched that they sort of forget to point out that that's what's going on. So, I mean, just as a distant early warning or as like a, like a moral of all this story, a lot of times in your future, you're going to be studying the flow of a pulse or of a disturbance or of a piece of information or of a number or of a, or of a, of a vector or something from here to there. And it's not actually material object that you're talking about. And if, as long as you know in advance that that's what's going on, it, I think it helps make it easier to deal with the math and the predictions. A lot of times that's what's happening in PCHEM. A lot of times that's what's happening in instrumental. Okay. Is they're not talking about stuff. They're talk, they're not talking about the trajectories of particles. They're talking about the propagation of pulses. Just know that, but they won't always spell it out. So just like please understand that. Or, or they're talking about the the flow of a probability of a probability. And in general, anything that's not a piece of material in physics, I believe, is a piece of information. If it's not matter, but it matters, it's information of some kind. It's ultimately some kind of number. Okay, just that, so that's where we are in the course. We're soon going to embark on electricity for the rest, but that's what it's all about. Whether it's an electrical current or what the connection is that everything is immaterial from here on in, hence all the abstract mathematics. Now, sorry, what I was saying a second ago is that there's 24 of you in the room. The reason that, that I want to thank you and congratulate you about that is that means that all of you follow the instruction that, that all of you are here today as part of your fulfillment of the requirement of, of this exam. And like in every single one, in this class, every single one of you is here. Oh, actually, is that true? Actually, one person. Well, every one of you who is, I take that, but I think actually one person is missing. But, um, and I have to figure out who that is. Uh, normally, I don't take attendance. But today, I, I am acknowledging that if you're here right now, first of all, you should congratulate yourself on doing the right thing. Even if I get nothing done for the next hour, it's noted that you're here. And it's noted that one person is not. Um, um, and that is part of you doing the right thing with your exam. Also, every one of you who is here, well, if if you are here, you either have turned in your exam, so congratulations, that's good, job well done. Hopefully I'll get that back to you in a reasonable amount of time, but I know that wasn't easy. Hopefully you learned something. Or possibly you're one of the people that made a side that explained to me in advance with notice that you made a side arrangement, that you needed a side arrangement to accommodate your uh, exam. And if you made such a side arrangement, then okay, we made an arrangement. Then I'll look forward to your exam when we arrange. Those of you who didn't make such an arrangement, just know that it's also noted. And it, it, it might be your turn on the final exam that things happen. But, but in order for someone if, to have not turned in their exam for this period, it means they had to have given me notice and made an arrangement. And in some cases, certain people had to accept point penalties, to, depending on their arrangement or depending on their notice. And I will just bluntly say now, to all of you, because I'm praising you and I want you to feel good about the, that you did the right thing. If any of you right now is wondering about someone that you think did not do the right thing, or you feel like you know someone's not here or didn't turn in the exam or something like that, I can tell you, or if you're sitting there and you did not turn in an exam and you didn't make an arrangement with me, it doesn't. what that means is there is gonna be a point penalty. I mean, just to be clear, I don't want those of you who, who, who really contorted yourself to do the hard and right thing. I don't want you to think that it's gone unnoticed or that it wasn't worth it or that it made no difference. And you could have, the fact is if someone didn't communicate with me at all and didn't turn in the exam, um, I don't hate them. They're not a bad person. They're not a criminal. They don't deserve never to get a job in their life or something. Things happen, but they, and I will read their exam, but there will be a point penalty that those of you who turned in the exam will not have to worry about, just to be clear. Okay, I just want that to be clear because labs, I mean, I mean, because exams are big deals. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, actually, oh, that's funny. Oh, that's funny. All right, I'm seeing. Oh, okay, okay. I'm seeing things in the direct chat. Okay, okay, okay. One thing in the direct chat is funny. Yes, chemistry. I mean, PCAM in particular is. PCAM, it's true. Someone sort of made a joke in the direct chat, but it's actually true. PCAM really is disguised 
quantum physics. It is quantum physics, and it's hard. Um, I, I hopefully this class will help you at least have some context for understanding it. People do tell me that if you understand what a differential equation is and have some, and you have understand what a harmonic oscillation is, it's meant to help you a lot with PCM. But PCM really is. It's true. It's 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 it's. it's it's intro to quantum physics and it ain't a joke. Um, that is true. But also one of you just told me in the direct chat that you did the electrical car lab. Okay, so I just want you to know, we're gonna get into that lecture. I know that might've felt out of nowhere and you suddenly just had to play around with it. Like with, you know, I know that. Um, for many people, particularly with electricity, with electrical circuits, for many people, there's many people who, who find them intimidating and hard to make, they, you, you know, they either work or they don't, and you either get a light bulb to get off or you don't or whatever. But for what it's worth, there are those of us when we first see electrical circuits, we're like, have no idea what to do, even if we were good at equations and stuff like that. I was one of those people. I found them very intimidating at first and very like out of nowhere at first, but but ultimately it is part of physics and ultimately we're going to make sense out of them like we do everything else, and we'll be patient with you. But also, no, just know there's a, many people I find year after year can't follow, well, don't follow the equations or get lost in or bored with all this physics theory and stuff like that. But then they walk into an electrical circuit lab. And even if they sort of haven't known what's been going on for months in the lecture, they some, they're totally cool with circuits. Like circuits do feel like their own thing for many people. And they are kind of like a fresh start for many people. So that's also why we can just like throw them at you in lab without any background because they are kind of a self-contained thing. I will talk about them in lecture, believe me. But the bottom line of why you're doing them is because what's flowing around that wire in those circuits is just that. It's flow. It's not actually a thing. I mean, we talk about it like it's electrons and all of that, but I could tell you right, just but just like when I talk, just like when I make a sound, we talk about it as a motion through air molecules. When I make a sound, and this will bring us back to the lecture material today. Sorry, I see, I knew I was going to be all over the place today. When I, the key lesson to take away from all this wave stuff, all this unthingy stuff, the discussions is when I talk to you and I make a sound, it wouldn't work without there being a bunch of air molecules between me and you. Those air molecules between me and you are called the medium. We need the medium. We need the bunch of air molecules to be harmonically oscillating in place in a very fancy way for the sound to get from me to you. But if nothing else, if you take away nothing from this course besides this, please remember or understand that when I send a sound from me to you, yes, it couldn't work without there being a medium of air molecules to wiggle to create that sound. But no individual air molecule goes from me to you. That's the key point, right? It involves air, but sound is not air. I hope that's clear to everybody. Like I'm yelling, like I'm not, I'm not angry, but really, really, that's a big takeaway is air is the medium through which sounds propagate. Air is the stuff wiggling so that a wiggle of a certain shape pulses through the air. Similarly, with, and then someone just came, similarly, just so you understand with electricity, even if people talk about electricity as being electrical charges moving around a wire, even if they talk about it as a bunch of electrons in a wire that are moving around, just for the, to be clear, yes, electricity would not flow around a wire without there being a bunch of electrons, negative charges, in the wire, that is totally true. We need the electrons in the wire for there to be electrical current going through, just like we need a bunch of air molecules between you and me for a bunch of sound to go through, but the sound is not an air molecule and an electrical current is not an electrical charge, by which I specifically mean when current is, should someone, and I'm glad, someone just clarified for me in the direct chat that you started electricity in the lab already and I'm psyched, that's good. I mean, it means you're on track. and. And I don't know how you feel about it, but good. Like that's our next topic. And the, the connection between the topics is that whatever's going around and around in that wire, around and around in cycles, in round trips, that stuff that's going around in the wire involves the electrical charges of electrons, but there ain't no one given electron 
that is making a journey from the positive pole of the battery through the wire, through the resistor and back to the negative pole of the battery. Or if it does, it's a complete coincidence and a complete freak of nature. Just like there's no one water molecule that travels through the ocean to you when you see a wave ripple traveling through the ocean to you. I hope that, so that's a connection. It's a, it's a compression wave of charges that's rippling through the wire when you send current through the wire. It's a ripple through the charges. It's not an individual charge. Just, uh, just for whatever, uh, no problem. Uh, just, uh, since I'm babbling about this, just give me an electronic hand if you sort of understand what I just said. Like if you just sort of feel like you get like what electricity has to do with it. Awesome. Okay, I'll take that. It's good enough for me. Okay, so that's the connection. And that's it. And every, great. Thank you guys. I'm not even going to mention you right now because I'm spazzing out too much. Um, but that's what, so anything we do in this class, that's what the class is about, whether it's waves or electrical currents or electrical fields or electromagnetic radiation, the whole point is we are all about immaterial propagations now, immaterial flows. And anything that's immaterial, if it's not matter, as far as I'm concerned in, in the physical world, it's information, information about matter. So with that, I'm going to bring the board back and get to the final subtopic of today. Um, I, I do want to still say some more things about waves themselves, specifically sound waves. I mean, ideally, I, 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 I uh, yeah. So I'm going to say some more things about sound waves. Um, also, you're not, you don't have any homework this week. I mean, if you have, if you want to do anything about once you turn in the exam, if you want to do anything about physics this week, it would just be go back and do any old thing that you still want to improve or you still owe me. I will still accept all of that. I'm not assigning anything new this week because it is vacation. It is a holiday and all that. But it's, it's true that we seem to sort of have two weeks off. I, I might have to post something in the middle, something small just to keep us on track. That's a warning of that. But um, but take a break for a couple of days. Now, let me get this. I think there's something in the chat. No, okay. All right. Sorry. I am spazzy. I'm going to get the chat going. I mean, I'm going to get the board going. Chat going. Okay. okay. So, What I want to talk to you about, what I want to talk to you about now, it, what the hell, is a, um, as I say, a final subtopic of waves. Specifically, what I want to talk to you about now is the Doppler effect for sound waves. And the Doppler effect for sound waves involves the two equations written on the board here. Let me explain. I, uh, and you don't have to copy those equations. They're come up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is kind of a complicated board here, as you see. I'm just going to talk, and hopefully, you, if you have, I'm going to talk you through this. I, I, as I, I'm a little spazzy today. I'm going to talk. Please try to copy this thing down that you see on the, there's a lot going on here. I'm going to try to talk about it and explain it to you. But just if you have handwriting issues, just please let me know in the chat or if it, because there's a lot going on in this board um, and on this slide. Um, we're going to talk about the Doppler effect, case one. Um, I'm going to set you up with case one of the Doppler effect. I'm going to set you up with numbers. I'm going to set you up with an example. I'm going to set you up with the problem and, and explain uh, um, what it would mean to solve this problem. Even this, oh, I believe in your class. Oh, yes. Now, I do know in your, stop me if I'm wrong, but I do remember now, given where you are in lab, I know you did a board meeting on the, yeah, oh, oh, okay, wait, there's a question in the chat, but my impression is that you had actually did a board meeting on this with Melendez a couple of weeks back, which is great. So hopefully you have some exposure to what I'm talking about here. So I'll, I'll try to speak, but tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe you, and I, that doesn't mean I think you fully understand it or you fully mastered it, but I feel like you've been exposed to this. So I'm going to talk from that point of view, but let me see what's in the chat. It looks like, oh, it was kind of right. Okay, no, no, fair enough. Um, Okay, no, and I welcome the, again, because I'm being so all over the place today, I know I always am, but I'm seeing these things in the chat and they are helping me a lot. They're like 
helping me teach in a more helpful fashion. So keep this feedback coming in the chat. Because if I'm going to be all over the place, I might as well at least say things that are that that are responsive to what's in your mind. So so so, so I'm looking in the chat. One person in the direct chat is confirming that yes, you did see this in the lab, but one person saying it was kind of rough, which I believe. And I and they're saying LOL, which is nice. It softens the blow. They're sort of joking, but I understand they're sort of not. And I believe it was rough. It usually is the first time. So I'm not going to assume that you mastered it, but. In fact, I'm going to assume that what our usual purpose of doing things first in the lab and then years, I'm going to assume at least you saw enough to know that you don't know it or to have questions or concerns or curiosities that I'm going to start to try to address today. Um, but then all, but now someone also in the chat has asked, can the Doppler effect be described as sort of a redshift, but for sound? Well, I don't know if everybody, I'll, I'll repeat that. I'll repeat that. Someone's asked in the chat, can the Doppler effect be described as sort of a redshift? but for sound? Well, the simple answer is absolutely yes. Now, I don't know if everybody in the room knows what that question means, but it's a good question. And the answer is yes, I will back up. I'll, so I'll say more about that, but great question. But and the answer is yes. <laughs> now, what's the deal? Um, okay, I'm going to switch. I will go back to this page. I promise you this page might look like sort of what you were dealing with in the lab. It'll have the numbers and all that. But let me skip a page for a second and say this. Here's what the Doppler effect is. Okay, this page right here, hold on, I'm gonna, and please keep things going in the chat, especially like the person that said it was rough and I totally believe you and I totally am not offended that you said that, or I mean, maybe I should be, but um, but feel free, that person who said it was rough, feel free to elaborate please and or tell me like when I get to an issue that is or is not helping you from whatever was rough in the lab or other people who, since someone just said it was rough, take that as an invitation that you can elaborate too, like, I mean, don't say it was rough because like, like the windows were closed and we all smelled bad. I mean, like, I, I mean, I, I don't need, I, there's nothing I can do about that or something, but like, if you have things to say about like, we didn't understand what was meant by wavelength, there's like, oh, I'm here to help today would be a good day for me to straighten out. So I'm all open to whatever that feedback is, but, but here's what the Doppler effect is in general. Okay. The Doppler effect is an effect that happens for waves in general. And it's when the receiver of a wave measures a different wave frequency from that which is measured by the source. Okay, it's when a source of a wave and the receiver of the same wave disagree on the frequency of the wave. And when I say disagree, I don't mean like have a stupid temperamental fight in the hallway and like, you know, and quibble over it. I mean, when they get two different legitimate but diff correct but different measurements for the frequency of that wave, okay? So the Doppler effect, what the effect is, is when I send a wave to you and I measure one frequency for that wave and you measure a different frequency, as long as it arises from the following condition. And again, I mean, when we both have a legitimate, correct frequency measurement on that wave. Now, why would that ever happen legitimately in physics? It arises, like down there for the what's written in the blue at the bottom. If it says the frequency disagreement depends on disagreement between velocities of source and receiver. And let me be more specific about that. Hang on. As measured relative to the medium for that wave. Now, this is a lot of English. Oh, okay. Oh, this is helpful. I see something in the chat. Hang on one second. Oh, what a great, I totally get, okay, direct chat person who said, yeah, we kind of understood the idea, but we missed a couple of parts about adding the portions together, like when we did perspective last semester. Great comment. I mean, okay, obviously not everybody in the room knows what you're, but I know what you're talking about, person. And that's a great connection to when we did perspective last semester. It is all about perspective, like from last semester. It's all about that. And yes, I understand what you're saying, that that's what you missed. Now I'm going to tell everybody, I want to try to get the basic idea down. I want, it may take one more class. I want to instruct you as to how to, so to speak, add the different parts together and get the perspectives correct. Maybe I, I'll hurry myself up and get to that, but I totally hear you. That's very helpful. Um, 
So, so yes, okay. So to back up for a second, the Doppler effect is like what it is, what happens when the perspective character of velocity meets the medium character of waves. The Doppler effect is something that happens only to waves and always to waves, but it happens to waves because velocity is by its nature a relation between two objects rather than the property of one single object, right? So yes, all that stuff that we did about perspective or frames of reference or relativity, all that stuff we did about that last semester is exactly what comes to a head here. Once waves are traveling, it applies to waves in a very direct way that ends up giving rise to this thing called the Doppler effect. So the condition, and I want to get into the mathematical details of that. That is where it gets confusing for sure. Um, the condition for the Doppler effect is when the source of a wave is in a different frame of reference from the receiver of a wave. When one of them, when, when they each do not have the same velocity as each other relative to the medium for that wave. So, so it can happen to any kind of wave, but specifically the, the version of wave that we're interested in here is when it happens to sound. The medium for sound is air, generally, air at standard temperature and pressure. So the context that we're talking about here is, if I send you a sound through the air, and either I am moving relative to the air, or the air is moving relative to me, which is the same thing, right? So either I'm running through the air, or it's windy, same thing, or you're moving relative to the air, or the air is moving relative to you, but not at the same rate as me, right? So if I'm standing still in the air and you're moving through the air, or you're standing still in the air and I'm moving through the air, in either of those cases, what will turn out is that we will disagree on the measured frequency for this wave. Much like if you were if you were at the beach and some big ship were creating waves, right? Some ship, some huge like cruise ocean liner, like sitting there and it's creating these ripples in the water and you're standing at the beach. And let's just say the ripples in the water are traveling at five meters per second. Right. And you're, I mean, not five minutes, but like, say there's like five ripples every minute that are traveling toward you. If you're standing on the beach, then five ripples will hit you every minute. But if you are running toward them, and I hope everybody's following me on this, just to get the overall, and I, I do appreciate the direction. I, it sounds like probably you do have the conceptual overview, but the conceptual overview is if I were standing on the beach, the waves would hit me exactly as frequently as they were sent from the boat or whatever. But if I start running toward them, if they were sent out of this boat at five crests, five cycles, five peaks, five ripples per every minute, if I'm running toward them, I'm going to hit, I'm going to encounter them more frequently than five every minute, right? Because they're coming toward me that way, but I'm, I'm, I'm running toward them. So I don't have to wait for the next one, a full fifth, of a minute, like I would have to wait a full fifth of a minute for it, but I'm running toward it. So I'm gonna shorten that time. So they're gonna to come to me more frequently than they were sent. And my frequency measurement will be correct from my reference frame. And the frequency measurement made by the ship will be correct from its frame of reference, reference frame, but we're both in different reference frames. So we will measure two different frequencies. That's the Doppler effect in general. Now we have to do the math. We have to do the math, but that's a Doppler effect in general. Also in general note, as you probably did in the lab, there's really four basic possible cases for the Doppler effect. Either the receiver is moving in toward the source, approaching, or the receiver is moving away from the source, receding. So case one would be like receiver approach. Case two would be like receiver recede. Case three would be like the source approaching. 
Case four would be the source receding. Four basic cases to understand the Doppler effect in full. It's pretty good to have exposed yourself and done the math for each of those cases. They are similar, but, but not identical. Um, final sidebar on the conceptual overview. This is something that can happen with any kind of wave, but it's, it's true that when it happened, well, well, let me pause on that for a second. Let me say, when it happens, with sound waves, what happens with sound waves, our experience of it is the basic thing in New York City of a motorcycle coming toward you and then passing you and you hearing something like, eh, right? That basic, and I'm not, well, that basic thing, eh, that's the Doppler effect. Why? Specifically, so I'm backing up on a page here. Specifically, Oh yeah, here we go. So specifically, the Doppler effect applies to all waves, but in particular case of sound, I just want to note, and I do want to try to get to the math here. Anyway, I want to note um, in the particular case of sound, the frequency of a wave is interpreted by the human brain as pitch or note, right? Or what some people sometimes would call tone, although that's slightly different actually, but like, but not volume. What frequency is uh, 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 so, so, so like when you recognize the note A, as in the middle A of a piano, or let's middle C. I mean, a lot, not everybody knows what that means, but a lot of you know at some level what that means. If you, and a lot of you know at some level that notes are labeled like C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then C, D, et cetera. People, if you hear, if you go over to a piano keyboard and you press the C key, uh, key that's in the middle of all the white keys, the middle C, you press that and you hear that note. What that is, is 200, that is sound, that is air molecules vibrating at 256 cycles per second, like literally. Like that's what makes it a middle C. If you hit the middle A, it's 440 cycles per second. That's what you're recognizing as middle A. Whether you call it A, whether you know music theory or not, um, that's what it is. More specifically, an A up, an octave up is 880 hertz. It's like another 440 up. Another octave up A is 1320 hertz, like another 400. The C is like an octave up C is 512 hertz. Another octave up is, is 768 hertz. Now, again, you all know notes and things like that to different levels, but let me just try to emphasize this. Even if you, all of you listen to music of some kind or another, sometimes, I'm sure. Even if you don't think you know anything about C or A or anything, even if you think you have a bad sense of pitch, or even if you've never played an instrument, or you think you can't sing or something like that, I know that you know your favorite song. And you know that if you went to a karaoke bar and someone else were singing your favorite song and they were bad, well, first of all, you'd know it. But second of all, like, or maybe even if they were good, but maybe really good, but you know your song, your favorite song, and they're singing your, and I don't, even if it's barely singing, even if it's like the talking hip hop, like you know your song and they're singing it. If they get to a certain note and they blow it, like they sing too flat, too low in the note, right? I know that you know it and you go, oh, I wish someone else were singing right now, right? Or you're like, boo, or whatever. Or you wish you were the one, right? Like you know it. When someone doesn't sing the right note, as long as they're wrong enough, you know it. And I just want to establish that what it is that you're knowing when someone hits the wrong note, especially if you know enough to know, oh, they were flat, oh, they're way too low, they should have been higher, they should have been sharper with that. What your brain is registering is that the number of cycles was too low. Like what makes a note a note is the number of vibrations per second. I mean, it's that mathematical. And what makes notes fit together in a good way or a bad way or so is the math. Like, well, I don't want to get into all that right now. But what I'm saying is what reaches you, if I sing a middle A on the piano, and if I sing it right, which I wouldn't, um, 
air molecules vibrate at 440 cycles per second. Then they hit your eardrum and your eardrum vibrates at five, uh, 440 cycles per second. And then sends an electrical signal through your brain, which vibrates, oscillates harmonically at 440 cycles per second. In the end of the day, what lands on your brain as the right note, whether you call it an A or not, whether you know where it fits on an instrument or whatever, if it hits you as right, what means is the correct number hit your brain and your, re and your brain recognized that number as correct. And it means that number, that frequency measurement traveled all the way from the source of the sound to your receiver, right? And it traveled through a bunch of different media. It means there were vibrations, oscillations, wave crests and troughs propagating first through like vocal cords, whatever that means, then through air molecules, then through ear cartilage, then through electrical currents. It means there was a wave that was traveling through a bunch of different media and probably almost definitely changing its speed each time it changed its medium, um, but all the while somehow preserving its frequency. And its frequency is that landed in you, at you at the, at the end. And, that, and that's what you register as correct or incorrect, or whatever. And then it fits in with every other note that you're hearing or every other instrument and all that stuff. And every bit of sound you hear, once you interpret it, what you're interpreting is a number. And this is part of what I mean when I say to send a wave is to send information. We're sending a raw number when we send even just one note, let alone a ton of notes and chords and all that, then we're sending a ton of numbers and a ton of mathematical equations and relations. But this is part of what I mean when I, like what lasted, what went from my mouth to your ears and the final analysis all the way through is nothing but a certain quantity that got preserved somehow through this whole journey. Okay, now in the case of sound, I'm getting, and if I never, direct chat person who, explain to me what was clear, was not clear in the lab. I totally appreciate the feedback. If I never end up clarifying it today, because I'm so out of, I apologize in advance, but I will clarify it next time. I promise, but I hear you loud and clear. I'm trying to get there. I'm just all over the place. Um, first thing I'm just trying to say is that for sound, frequency is pitch. Volume is amplitude. If you get, like, that's a whole different issue. And that has nothing to do with the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is about frequency, so in the case of sound, it's about, I send, it's about the motorcycle is making one tone on its horn, sending one sound, one pitch, one note. And it sounds like one note to the person on the motorcycle. And as they're driving with that note, they hear all the while, eh, like all the same. But as they're coming toward you, you hear one note. Eh, but then as they're going away, you hear a different, oh, right? Because you're not in the same frame of reference as the motorcycle, therefore you don't hear the same frequency. And in the case of sound, frequency is note. Sidebar, the person who put in the, in the sidebar for the person who put something in the chat. In the case of a light wave, which is what we end the course with, frequency is color. So yes, when light undergoes, when starlight in particular undergoes a Doppler effect, um, it's called the redshift. So just to answer the question in the direct chat, oh yes, redshift is the light color version of the Doppler effect, which is a general wave phenomenon, yes. And what we're dealing with here is the sound version of it. Okay. Um, okay, I might as well get to this, back to this setup. Well, yeah, let's just, I'll try to get straight to it since you've done this in the lab. So let's do this example. You did a different example in the lab. You did a different example, but here, let's do this example. It's case one. Case one, let's do a case where the receiver is approaching the source. So, okay, so what's, so I've, so what's given? First of all, like I'm saying W stands for wave, M stands for medium, S stands for source, R stands for receiver. Okay, um, and I'm saying, and, and here's the information I'm giving you. First of all, the velocity, well, also, V subscript subscript always means the velocity of one object relative to another, just like physics 203. That's right. Like it means the velocity of one object as measured in the frame of reference of another object. Okay. 
So whichever is the second subscript is the, is the object that views itself as a stationary and it sees the first object moving by it. So the first fixed given in all this is that VWM, VWM stands for velocity of wave relative to medium. In this case, that means the velocity or the speed of sound relative to air, air at standard temperature and pressure. So that number is given as 340 meters per second. That is a standard real like planet Earth number. Sound travels relative to air at standard temperature and pressure at, a, at approximately 340 meters per second. Now, that is fixed and constant. That is the fixed constant around which this whole situation pivots. The whole, the, and this, this is the reason that the Doppler effect comes up with, let me back up. All velocities are relational. All velocities are about perspective, like the direct chat person was saying. But waves have this special thing where a wave cannot travel unless there's a medium through which the wave is traveling and the medium fixes the velocity of the wave. This is our new piece of information from last week and the week before. Baseballs can travel at any speed at all. Baseballs travel at a speed that's dependent on how fast the person throwing them was moving. But waves travel at a speed that is entirely fixed by the medium through which they travel. If I send sound through air, it the sound travels at a speed which is omega over k, the angular frequency divided by the angular wave number. And the angular frequency, remember, is square root of k over m. The angular frequency is fixed entirely by parameters, by the material properties of the medium. And, and so is k ultimately. So what I'm saying is that the speed at which sound travels through the air is fixed by how elastic ultimately the air molecules are. And I can't do anything about how elastic the air molecules are. So even if I run fast before the sound comes out of my mouth, or even if I run backwards before the sound comes out, while the sound is coming out of my mouth, the sound, the minute it comes out of my mouth, it just goes at a certain speed relative to the air. That's the key thing to know about waves, why this whole Doppler effect thing occurs. So VWM, the velocity of the wave relative to the medium, is the first given in any Doppler effect problem. And it is given by the nature of the medium and no, and, it, and it's no, nobody can do anything about it. Then what else is given is, say, the frequency of the wave relative to the source. That's FWS over to the left, above that thing that looks like a speaker. Like we're supposedly we have a speaker here creating sound and it's going toward a person. And supposedly in this whole setup, the speaker is sitting still. So VSM velocity of source relative to medium is zero meters per second. The speaker is sitting still relative to the air. It's just sitting in the air and it's sending out this sound at a frequency of 500 Hertz as measured by the source, by the speaker itself. The sound comes out 500 cycles per second from the speaker, which is fixed stationary in the air. While, and the sound comes out at 340 meters per second relative to the air. Like notice VWM equals 340 meters per second. And notice VSM equals zero. The M means medium. Those are measurements being made relative to the medium. Then you've got this dude, this receiver, the person who's hearing the sound, running toward the speaker at an incredibly high speed of 40 meters per second, right, to the left. But notice VRM means that's how fast the person is running relative to R, R means receiver, M means medium. So that's how fast the person is running relative to the air, right? The per so the sound is coming out at 340 relative to the air. And everybody has to know that. Like, that's just what sound does. It goes relative to the air at a certain speed. But if you're moving relative to the air, then from your perspective, from the dude's perspective, from the receiver's perspective, that means air is moving relative to him or her. So, so something's going on here where the sound is traveling through this box of air at 340, but the whole box of air is coming toward the receiver at 40. So the whole thing is going to come toward the person faster 
then it was leaving the speaker because there is relative motion between the receiver and the air, right? So that's going to give rise to this thing called the Doppler effect. Now, I, I really do want to do the math with you because I know you, oh, okay. Oh, oh, already. Oh, I, I was just about to say, but let me say something that you actually need me to say, but maybe it sounds like maybe I did. Oh, okay. Oh, that's really helpful. Okay, okay. And I'm still going to keep going. I, I, I didn't even, good. Thank you for all this feedback, direct message person. Um, um, but okay, I can maybe do slightly better than that. So, so, but that's the setup. But hopefully at least, it sounds like to at least one person, the setup is sort of getting clear now. Um, yeah, M stands for medium. While well, these givens were in terms of the medium, but the ultimate, what I'm claiming, okay, what I'm claiming is that receiver is going to receive, it's going to measure a frequency that is different from the one that was sent by the speaker. Like, I think that person is not going to measure, not going to receive a 500 hertz sound. More specifically, if a 500 hertz sound is a little bit above an A, maybe it's like a B or it's an A sharp or a B on them. And again, it does, you don't know what those terms mean. It doesn't matter. I'm just saying if a 500 hertz sound is like a certain note that, that the people at the speaker are hearing, the person running toward the speaker is going to hear a different note. And I'm going to tell you, and we're going to find out what that note is, what the number is. It's going to be a frequency other than 500. That's what we're going to solve in this problem is what is the received frequency. And I'm going to tell you right now, my prediction is that it's going to be something higher than 500 because the person's running into the sound, running into the speaker. If the person were running away, they would hear something lower than 500. But because they're running in, they're going to hear something higher than 500. The question is, how high? Okay, that's, but the goal of every Doppler effect, every Doppler effect problem is you get a bunch of givens like the ones I just gave you. This whole B PDF is going to be uploaded, of course. I'm just skipping around it so I can show you things. In every Doppler effect, what's given is what's written on the top right there. What's given is the frequency of the wave relative to the source, the velocity of the source, right? So in other words, what note was played according to the speaker, What's also given is the velocity of the source relative to the medium and the velocity of the receiver relative to the medium. In other words, how fast are the source and the receiver going compared to the air or whatever the sound is traveling through? And if they're both traveling at the same speed, then there is no Doppler effect. But usually one of them is traveling at zero relative to the medium and the other is traveling at some non-zero number. And that's why the Doppler effect happens. If they're not both traveling, if they're not both traveling at zero relative to the medium, then there's going to be a Doppler effect. So you're usually given how fast they're both moving compared to the medium. And then you're given the velocity of the medium relative to, uh, sorry, you're usually given, you're always given the velocity of the wave relative to the medium because that's the one thing we know from the start. That's like the speed of sound in air or whatever. And what you have to find in every Doppler effect problem is, Okay, given all that, what's the frequency of the wave relative to the receiver? What frequency got received? That's what we got to figure out. Okay, and we have 12 minutes. I'm actually going to do the example for you right now. Because you've already experienced this, but there was confusion, hopefully you, I can do this for you right now. The two equations that are used in order to do this, the two equations to use, I'll tell you right now, or as you might have known from the lab, are the one, are the ones right? He, no, I just lost the board. Of course, hold on, hold on. It's coming back. Okay, the two equations that are used in the Doppler effect are the ones slowly dissolve. Yes, right there. Now, let me. I'll quickly tell you the first equation. If you just back up all the way, don't get intimidated. It just says V equals lambda F. Speed equals wavelength times frequency for any given wave. That's one of three different equivalent. That's what we established two weeks ago or last Monday or whatever. That's just saying the speed of a wave is how far it is in space from one cycle to the next divided by how far it is in time from one cycle to the next. Wavelength divided by period, which is the same thing as wavelength times frequency. 
which by the way is the same thing it all comes from angular frequency divided by angular wave number all the same way of saying the speed of a wave on average is the distance covered by the wave divided by the time but the one catch of a wave notice the subscripts now it says the velocity of a wave relative to medium equals the wavelength of the wave relative to the medium times the frequency of the wave times the relative to the medium the whole point is what we know about a wave automatically is that a, it travels at a fixed constant rate through its medium. The medium fixes the rate of propagation. It propagates at that number through relative to, compared to the medium. If someone were to move the whole medium or move past it, then they would observe something different. But relative to the medium is what we know. So that's equation one that all the Doppler effect solutions revolve around. Then the other equation is the thing from physics 203 that direct chat person was sort of like raising. Equation number two that we use is the three object case of, I know it looks like I just like moved past it, but look, here it is again. Okay, just to remind you from physics 203, Galileo's principle of relativity, form number four, says in so many words that velocity is a comparison between two objects. It's not a property of one. So if you have, so if you have any two or three objects, A, B, and C, the velocity of A relative to itself is always zero. I'm saying this quickly, because again, I think you kind of know this. I want to apply this in nine minutes to how to get a solution. Velocity of me relative to you is always the opposite of the velocity of you relative to me, right? If I'm going to the east past you, then you're going to the west past me at the same number. And the velocity of me relative to the subway plus the velocity of the subway relative to 8th Avenue is the velocity of me relative to 8th Avenue. That's why I can sit on a subway at rest relative to the subway while the subway goes 80 miles an hour down 8th Avenue. And lo and behold, I go 80 miles an hour down 8th Avenue. Get it, right? That's the third thing. So that third thing is where we're going to that is always true about velocities. We're going to deploy that along with the wave character uh, character of waves in order to solve for the Doppler effect. We're going to put those two equations together in an intelligent way and solve. So our goal, we have eight minutes. Goal, the goal here with these numbers that are given. And if you could do one case, if you really follow the solution method, the exact solution method works the same way for all four cases. You just have to be careful about negative signs and so forth. The goal is to solve for whoop, the frequency of the wave relative to the receiver, right? That's our goal, given all the givens that we're given. Um, notice one last thing. The positive direction we set up is the direction in which the wave is traveling. Anything that goes against the wave is negative. Anything that goes with the wave is positive. So here we go. Here is, we have eight minutes. For solving Doppler effect problems, I have a three-step method, okay? We still have always our five step, but there's specifically, so I'll call, I won't call them steps. I'll call them uh, uh, planks. Plank one, I don't know, you could call them steps, but plank one, always first solve, always, this is how you solve all problems. Solve for the wavelength of the wave relative to the source, okay? And I'm going to do this a little quickly, but hopefully you'll, you'll be familiar. This is what you always do to solve a top. Again, our goal is to find the frequency according to the receiver. The frequency according to the source was 500. We're trying to find the frequency according to the receiver. I'm predicting it's going to be higher than 500. How am I going to do it? First, I'm going to get the wavelength of the wave according to the source. How do I do that? Well, wait. I know always that velocity of the wave is equal to wavelength times frequency of the wave or whatever. So the wavelength of the source is equal to, here it is. So wavelength is gonna equal velocity over frequency. Simple enough, right? But now here's the catch with six minutes left here. Um, so I'm gonna plug in numbers in a second. But here's the part that direct type person might benefit from or whatever. I'm going to plug in numbers for V and F. But note, I don't technically have VWS. That wasn't a given. I don't have the velocity of the wave relative to the source. What I have is the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. That's what's 340 meters per second. That's the speed of sound relative to air. I don't know the velocity of the wave relative to the source. But what I know is 
the velocity of the wave relative to the source will be the velocity of the wave relative to the medium plus the velocity of the medium relative to the source. That's Galileo's principle, right? That's the subway idea. I'm using, in other words, I'm using the other equation now. If I, so I'm going to write that in. I'm going to say, Okay, I don't know the velocity of the wave relative to the source, but I know that velocity of wave relative to medium plus medium relative to the source must equal wave relative to the source. Now, what is the velocity of the medium relative to the source? Well, I don't know that, but I know that the velocity of the medium relative to the source must be the opposite of the velocity of the source relative to the medium. And by the way, that was zero. So the velocity, okay, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm showing you the method that always works. There's always a zero involved somewhere in the method. It might come at the beginning, might come at the end. The zero is always involved somewhere, but you don't know until you do it. So it's not, so if you just do this whole method every time, wherever the zero ends up, it ends up. But I'm saying, okay, the, in other words, I'm saying, okay. So the velocity, in other words, the source is not moving at all relative to the medium, to the air. Therefore, the air is not moving relative to it. So just as you would expect, therefore, the velocity of the medium relative to the source, the air relative to the speaker is zero. Therefore, in this case, in this case, I apparently don't have to worry about it, but I found that out. I didn't just guess that. So the, velo so the wavelength of the wave relative to the source equals the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. That's 340. Over the frequency of the wave relative to the source, that's 500. Right, Hertz? So the wavelength of the wave relative to the source is a 0.68 oh, meters, okay? That's the end of, we have four minutes. That's the end of step plank one of the method. You get the wavelength according to the source first. Now there's only two more steps and this always, or two more planks. Plank two is super easy. Plank two is what, the reason that we always solve for the wavelength according to the source first is because the wavelength is the one thing that will be constant for the whole situation. Both the source and the receiver always, no matter what case it is, have to agree on the wavelength. The distance between two crests is the same. I mean, that doesn't change as the wave is traveling, no matter what. So I say plank number two, the, the wavelength of the wave relative to the receiver must always equals the wavelength of the wave relative to the source. So therefore now I go to plank three and we're just about done, believe it or not, with three minutes with plank three, I say, okay, the frequency of the wave relative to this receiver must be the velocity of the wave relative to the receiver over the wavelength of the wave relative to the receiver. And we have that, we just figured it out. It's, it's 0 0.680 meters. So the only thing we have to do now to get the frequency is plug in the velocity of the wave relative to the receiver. Now, do we know that? No, we don't. But we know that the velocity of the wave relative to the receiver must be the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. Whoops, sorry. I'm just doing the exact, it's the exact pattern I did in plank one. Plank one is you do a pattern. Plank two, you say the wavelengths are the same for both. Plank three, you just do the, the pattern again, but backwards. VWM plus VMR, is what will equal VWR. So in other words, 340, right? Now, plus what's VMR? VMR must equal the negative of VRM. What's VRM was 40 going against the wave, i.e. negative 40. So here's the tricky part. You have to think about this. I only have two minutes. So I'm gonna say it, you have to think about it. But I say that it is plus, it's plus, negative, negative 40. It's negative 40, like VRM, I'm saying VRM is negative 40. The receiver is going against the wave at negative 40 because the wave's going this way, it's the receiver's going that way, negative 40. But this wants VMR. So I've got to flip the flip. So I get, so I get that frequency, this is our last step, I promise, Frequency of the wave relative to the medium equals 340 plus 40 all over 0 0.680. So 380 over 0 0.60. And on, I know we have one minute. We have one minute. But that, 
frequency equals three three eighty over point six eight. And indeed, that's higher than five hundred. This is the answer. You get a number that's higher than 500, approximately 559 hertz, higher than 500. And I'm telling you this, I did that very fast. We'll talk again about it in two weeks or whatever. But that method is exactly the method you would do for any case. You just have to watch the negative signs super carefully as I did. If you think about the negative signs, you'll see what I did. As long as anything going with the wave is positive and anything going against the wave is negative, and as long as you realize that the velocity of me relative to you is the negative of the velocity of you relative to me. So we did get a double negative sign here, but it ended up adding. And in some of the other cases, you would get a zero in step in plank three rather than in plank one. But that's the method. That's how you get it. I know that was fast. And again, the direct chat person, I appreciate. But we'll do the other cases later. But anyway, have a very nice but congratulations again. I'll stay for a minute if there's a question, but that's okay. Yes. Thanks. Have a good yeah. day, Professor. Thank you. All of you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good. Thank you. Have a nice break. Yes, all of you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. And sorry again. And thank you. All good. Thank you. Okay. And I'll turn. And um, all good. Um, Rashmart, are you there? Are you copying? Or shall I? Are we all good? Rashman. Are you good, Rashman? Or are we going once, going twice? Goodbye.